watch time. Okay, that sealer coat's gonna need a couple hours to dry. So I have a little time here to outline what my steps are for paint prep and kind of DIY paint work. As you know, I prepped my entire car and did a lot of the painting here in the garage, but most of the exterior panels were done at a paint booth with Mario's help. But I learned a lot and I'm gonna share all those things with you right now. Before you paint any panels in your car, you gotta make sure it fits the car first. That was the case on this bumper. It didn't fit the car at all. It's fiberglass. I ended up bending it to shape. If it's metal, you have to cut it, twist it, bend it, do whatever you do, but it's gotta fit the car before you start the bodywork. Next, you gotta tackle the heavy bodywork. If there's you know, dents or whatever you need to fix, now's the time to do that. Hammer and dolly, whatever. In this case, this bumper only had some cracks in the gel coat. So it was a matter of digging out the cracks and re-fiberglassing with epoxy resin to fill those up. There was also a few diggers on the bottom that I re-fiberglassed. Then I roughed up the existing paint with 180 grit. Uh, on my car, I went all the way down to bare metal, 80 grit. But on this fiberglass, it's uh, not recommended to sand through the gel coat. After the paint was roughed up, I did three coats of epoxy primer. Don't hurry the epoxy primer. You gotta let it dry between coats. And with SPI, you can't put it on too heavy. In addition to letting it dry between coats, once you got the third coat on there, give it some time to dry. I mean shrink, because the stuff is gonna shrink over time. You know, I put mine out in the sun. I went to Hawaii on vacation. Um, I think you get the idea. There's no point in hurrying along. The advantage we have as DIY guys is we have time on our sides and we can't usually get to it eight hours a day, seven days a week. So rather than running it through like a body shop would, take advantage of the dry time let the stuff shrink and come back to it in a couple days. Once it's fully cured, I like to just scuff it up a little bit with the gray Scotch-Brite pad. That allows the dry guide coat to sort of sit on the surface and stay on the surface. This is what the guide coat looks like when you apply it. This is, this is the powder type. And it just rubs into the primer. This is a good example of what the guide coat does for you. See these dark, darker circles? That is guide coat that has not been sanded. So you can really see this needs a little bit more sanding. There's a couple fish eyes from the previous paint, or maybe it's in the primer, I'm not sure. But this has been gone over with the guide coat and then you keep sanding until everything is the same color. Good examples here where there's just a couple divots that's a scratch right there. That all needs to be sanded out before the base coat can go on. That's the point of the guide coat. You definitely use it, it's your friend. After you put the guide coat on, then it's block sanding time. This is the laborious part. You know, use the right block, straighten it out as much as you can. This is where you get a good read on how straight the piece is. If it's wavy, you're gonna find out when you use the long block. So this is the time that you're really perfecting the piece. This is what creates a good paint job, is basically the block sanding. Take your time on the block sanding, keep sanding until the guide coat is all gone. You're likely to have to fill in some pinholes. I use dolphin glaze for that. Any kind of uh, scratches need to be completely filled up. Do not expect the paint to fill any scratches. The paint can only fill like 600 grit scratches. Don't expect it to fill anything less than that. There's a little bit of dolphin glaze right here. So I'm just gonna go over it real quick with some fresh paper. It blends roughly the same as the epoxy primer, but you just wanna use light pressure, let the block do the work. little guide coat on each side and you just watch it disappear. A 
when you're going after a little divot like that, you want to sand the entire area down, not just dig into that little hole. Just let the block go down into the layers of the primer. And eventually that divot will get smaller and smaller. Okay, any areas that you broke through, whether it's bare metal showing or paint underneath showing, I like to do another uh, spot prime with epoxy primer. Make sure it's all the same color. Next up, if this is like a door or something large, then you could go with the 2K high build primer. And that's really useful for evening out big waves in the panel if it's a hood or something like that. That's where you can really straighten stuff out. The epoxy primer is best as a adhesion promoter and also a, cor a corrosion inhibitor. So it's, it's a great product, but it's not super high build. So if you got a lot of waviness, use 2K high build primer, load that stuff on, and then sand the majority of it off. At this point, you should start to see a perfectly smooth surface. You've already gone up through 220 grit, you've gone 400 grit, and now you can start to see a little bit of reflection. You can wipe the wax and grease remover on it. Look at the reflection, know if you're straight or not. You shouldn't have any pinholes or scratches at that point. Now it's time for the sealer coat. And for me, the sealer coat is just SPI primer with a little bit of urethane reducer in it. It's, it just lets it flow out really, really nice. Then once the sealer coat's had a little time to dry, you may need to sand any nibs or something out of it with like 600 grit. For that, I go wet sand, 600 grit. The thing should look really great. So now we're finally ready for base coat. You know, all that work, there's like however many steps that was, all that stuff is very, very critical for a good paint job. So then a base coat is, um, you know, typically it's three coats. I like to do the first coat really light. Just kind of fog it on there a little bit. Start to see the transparency of the primer coming through a little bit. And then second coat is a pretty, pretty heavy coat. Uh, third coat's also pretty heavy. You want to make sure you got good coverage. I get a LED flashlight and I look for any areas that are not fully covered and just, you know, four coats if you need to, but three is usually enough, even with yellow. Okay, same with the base coats. You gotta take your time on it. Let the stuff dry between coats. You can't just keep piling it on over and over and over again. It needs to dry before the next coat. So I, I use like a slow uh, reducer. That gives me more time as I'm applying it. I tend to, you know, set my gun so it doesn't shoot out tons of paint. Like I said, don't be in a hurry, let it dry and then let it dry like a good hour before you try to put the clear coat on. Okay, so now it's the fun part, now it's the clear. It sh you shouldn't have to do any sanding to the base coat. If, you, if something's really wrong, then you got to go back, fix the base coat, sand it, reapply base coat, then clear coat right on top of that. You don't want to clear over sanded base coat. I don't think that's recommended. I just go right from the gun, um, let it dry for like an hour, right from the gun, base coat, clean it, clear coat, spray it. A good three coats of clear is really what you want. If you get a run, it's no big deal. In my opinion, a run is better than dry spray because a run is a little bit easier to fix. Dry, dry spray is, is kind of difficult to sand out. It's definitely doable, but like I said, I, I tend to put the clear on a little heavy. Okay, that's it. That's what I've done for my car. That's a real quick rundown on, on what, what I've done. Lessons learned are, you know, take your time. Like I said, just, I like to sand by hand, even though it takes longer and uh, just really read the instructions. Make sure you're giving this, the product enough time to do what the manual says it should do, and you should be fine. I found that the base coat, clear coat system is super forgiving. The equipment doesn't have to be super fancy. You know, I started on my project with a Harbor Freight gun to do the primer. Harbor Freight guns will absolutely shoot the epoxy primer. Um, not so much on the 2K. The 2K requires a little bit bigger, bigger tip, but you can do a lot with a Harbor Freight gun. 
I ended up going with the um, Warwick gun. I've been really happy with that. It's really an Iwata knockoff. I think it works just fine. I did notice that the spray pattern isn't as big as Mario's actual Iwata, but you're not gonna be going rapid speed anyways. I think the gun is fine. The actual paint itself, you know, shop around. This is not insurance work. And like I said, some of the higher quality, very expensive paint systems, they're designed for shops that do insurance work. And they, they reduce the dry times, they have all this technology in them to make people work faster. And if you're a DIY guy, you actually don't need that. So don't pay for something you don't need. That's why I like some of the independent companies like SPI. I use the SPI Clear and the Matrix Base Coat. I would use SPI Base Coat if it came in Bahama Yellow, but it doesn't. So I use Matrix for that. Matrix, a lot of people think Matrix is made by the same people that make PPG. Whatever factory makes PPG also makes Matrix. I don't know that that's really true, but that's what I'm told anyways. Here it is outside and it looks good. Really happy with it. Almost no fish eyes, it laid down really flat. I do use high pressure. I don't know if you can see, but there's one little dust nib right there. One of very few actually. There's one there, one right there. Um, those are just gonna polish out no problem. And then right here, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a little bit of a sag right here. Just a little too much clear, but not bad at all. This is the original paint. I cleared over that. The edge is not super great because there's a little bit of primer showing, but that's just to preserve the original color of this part. And then down here, I didn't do as much prep and you can really see right here is a scratch. The paint did not cover that scratch and I knew it was there, but I didn't fix it because it's on the bottom. So this is the kind of thing I was talking about in the prep. If you don't take care of this, it will show up in the paint. And this piece is a little closeout strip that I made. This goes under the hood when the hood's closed. It's a quick, quick garage tour here. I did put some plastic up. That's to protect that side of the garage. A little bit of things behind there on the storage rack. I didn't want to get overspray on it. Air compressor I'm not too concerned about. I did put this up right over the piece I was painting. So if anything fell from the garage, it would just land on that sheet and uh, didn't cause any dust to land on the part. I didn't do anything to the floor. Uh, I just left it as is and tried not to move too fast. I didn't put water down or anything like that. Um, the other thing I do is the air compressor. I leave the air compressor off. So that fan will blow a lot of air, could cause dust, and it's 175 PSI in an 80 gallon tank. So I can do all three coats of base coat without that thing even turning on. Plus it's an explosion hazard. When you get an arc in the windings, it can cause an explosion. So I do not turn the air compressor on. I did turn it on between base coat and clear coat, just to pump it back up. I did not run the fan, uh, at least this fan. I didn't run this at all. Um, once everything was dry, I used it to clear out the garage, just get the fumes out of here a little bit. Um, but I did use this fan right here. It's got a little filter on the back and that was kind of an exhaust fan going out that door. And that's it, you guys. That's all I did to get these parts sprayed. Another question I sometimes get is, how come you didn't paint the bumpers at the same time you painted the car? And it's kind of a long story. Um, basically, I should have. I mean, that's not brilliant on my part to do it in multiple steps. Uh, the reason why I waited on the bumpers is because I ran out of sanding energy. I was uh, tired of sanding. It took longer than I expected. I, I had some dates coordinated with the paint booth and with Mario, and it just I just couldn't get it done without just absolutely killing myself. And I was running low on motivation, so I just waited until now. Plus, I toyed with the idea of making them a different color. I was gonna go like a dark gray. And same with the rear bumpers. Uh, I just, I don't know, I ended up going yellow. Um, I like it yellow, you can't go wrong with that. 
If I do decide to make them gray later, I don't mind painting them again, or I could just wrap them. So that's really why I waited to the last minute. I'm pretty confident the paint's gonna match. In fact, I've already sprayed the headlight rings here in my garage after the fact, and they matched the body pretty well. So I think because it's low to the ground, I don't think it's gonna be a horrible issue with painting it multiple times or multiple months apart. And you are also notice I didn't spray the rear bumpers this time. The reason being is that in this little garage, I cannot tolerate any more overspray. I sprayed about a quart of base coat and a little less than a quart of clear. And if I was to do the rear bumpers at the same time, this place you wouldn't even be able to see in here. So I can do small batches, but to do the entire car, you know, we sprayed almost two gallons of paint on the car, uh, sprayable paint. And you can't do that in a garage without heavy duty exhaust fans. And that is dangerous, not only to me, but my family and the neighbors, all that. So it's just, it's just not safe to do it in an urban environment like I live. So that's why I, one, went to the paint booth and two, broke it up into smaller pieces. It just made sense for me. I mean, your results might vary. If I had a rural house, I would absolutely have tried to paint it myself. And I think the results uh, speak for themselves. I don't think you can tell a difference between what I painted and what Mario painted. The biggest difference is just managing the overspray.